Hello everyone and a really warm welcome to the first Facebook Live from Breast Cancer Now of 2024. It really is lovely to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to be joined tonight by um, Dr. Sarah Swan, who's a clinical oncologist. But before we get going with the session, there's just a few housekeeping things I thought I should go through with you. We have received some questions in the chat beforehand, so we'll try and get through as many as those as possible but as our session goes on if you have any further questions please do write them in the chat we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can if we run out of time tonight then what we'll do is we'll write a written reply to them in the next few days okay so you should get a reply by the end of the week there will be an evaluation form for tonight. Your your comments, your opinions are really gratefully received. Please tell us, you know, what went well, what other things we may have done differently, or if there's any other topics that you'd like to see on our Facebook Live series. So all comments gratefully received. Thank you. I also just wanted to let you know that on the 17th of February, <clears throat> we have a Younger Women's Together event in Leicester. So this is an opportunity for women who are 45 years and under, who have had a diagnosis of breast cancer, that it's an opportunity for them to come together and get support from other younger women and speakers as well. So there are spaces on that event. So if anyone would be interested to join, the details will be in the chat button and it really would be lovely to see you. Our next Facebook Live is on Thursday in a couple of days time and that will be looking at exercise. So please do feel free to join us then. If you have any questions or want any information, please do always call our helpline on 0808 800 6000. It's open Monday to Friday 9 to 4 and on a Saturday 9 to 1 and the team there will be very um, pleased to answer any questions you may have about anything related to your, to breast cancer. So without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Sarah Swan, our clinical psychologist. Hello, Sarah. Hello, Vic. Thank you um, so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Well, it's an absolute honour for you to join us. Thank <laughs> you. And I think, Sarah, certainly from the work we see on the, the calls we get from the helpline and the written questions we're getting from Ask Our Nurse Service, the psychological impact of breast cancer is, is really huge, isn't it? So I just wondered if you can tell us a little bit about you know your background and why this is of special interest to you. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'm a consultant clinical psychologist. Um, I worked in the NHS for around 25 years, um, but I left the NHS in 2019 and I now work in independent practice. So I've worked with people with a range of uh, mental health and emotional difficulties. Um, and currently my work involves um, individual therapy and supervising other psychologists. I also do training for businesses in relation to emotional well-being. And I also work for one of the psychology um, professional organizations, the Association of Clinical Psychologists. And I'm trained in a number of different psychological therapies. And um, I came across acceptance and commitment therapy a few years ago. And it really resonated with me. Um, I found this really personally helpful when I was going through a difficult work situation at the time when I did the training. And then in 2019, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And that's when my skills in this therapy really came, came in useful for me personally. Um, I had really excellent treatment through the NHS um, and that was during the pandemic as well. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, I really can't fault the, the treatment I received. But what I felt was that the emotional impact wasn't um, necessarily considered as much mm -hmm. as I thought it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and I did make use of the, the Someone Like Me service through Breast Cancer Now. Um, which I think you'll, you'll probably explain to people if they, they're not yeah. familiar with it. But I found that so useful to be able to talk with someone who's who's been through something similar themselves. And 
I had surgery and chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, and at the end of my treatment, I was offered a, a follow up call and I was sent a form in advance that I, I could go through and sort of tick any of my current concerns, anything that was worrying me. And I kind of thought, oh, great, this is going to be really my opportunity to, to talk through how I'm feeling emotionally. But I felt that the, the professional I, I spoke to felt, felt like they couldn't really hear my distress, couldn't really sit with it, couldn't, you know, allow me the space to talk it through. And I felt a bit like my emotions were being pathologized. She kind of said, oh, we need to sort you out. I'm going to have to refer you to counseling. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, I'm just experiencing what I think are normal emotions through this really difficult journey. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, throughout my journey, I kept reflecting on how hard I was finding it emotionally, even with all of my skills as a clinical psychologist. So um, that's why I went ahead and wrote a book about the emotional impact of breast cancer and how to cope with it, drawing on my personal experience as well as these skills in acceptance and commitment therapy that really helped me to, to navigate it. And it's a really, uh, it's a really interesting read. Your book, it's from the heart, isn't it? And I think many people uh, would relate to the information and the stories that that you show. It's interesting, Sarah, that you speak about the someone like me service. And I know you've uh, mentioned that, you know, throughout your writings. Mm -hmm. And if anyone's not familiar with that, the someone like me service at Breast Cancer Now is a peer support service. And what it does is it sort of buddies you up, if you like, with someone who's been through a similar situation. And we've had really positive uh, feedback about, you know, the support that gives. Because Sarah, I think what you're saying is no one really quite understands unless they've been through it. There is exceptions to every rule, of course, aren't there? But um, yeah, that's really interesting. Well, Sarah, we've had a few questions in that I wonder, and a lot of these are so relevant to your work, Sarah. But Emily's um, written in, is it normal to have disjointed emotions after finishing treatment? And really what a fantastic question that is. Mm, yeah. Maybe, could, can I just give a bit of background on acceptance and commitment yeah, therapy? Yeah, that would be really I, useful. Mm. I, think, I think that might help explain some of my, uh, where I'm coming from, my perspective. So within ACT, as we call it, um, it assumes that difficult thoughts and feelings are normal. You know, everybody has them. It's part of the human experience. And our, our usual automatic response to these, and I think particularly in today's society where we're kind of encouraged to think positively and be happy, you know. And fix. Yes. We're yes. fixers, aren't we? Yeah. Exactly. So our usual response is often to just try and squash them down, squash down these difficult feelings, push them away, avoid them. I don't want, I don't want this stuff around. And, and in some ways this works in the short term. We can feel better and not feel kind of overwhelmed by our emotions but in the long term it can actually kind of prolong our distress or it can make it worse or intense emotions might pop up when we least expect them or least want them because it's a bit like a jack-in-a-box that we're kind of having to keep a lid on the whole time and then it springs up when we when we least expect it and we can also kind of lose touch with what's important to us so in ACT, it helps us to connect again with what's important, our values, who we want to be, how we want to show up. And it encourages us to notice our thoughts and feelings in the present moment. And rather than push them away, open up to them, allow space for them. And that can feel really scary. But actually, if we drop the struggle with them, often it takes away a layer of distress and those initial emotions may or may may not pass immediately but they will pass eventually um, and actually if we focus then on what's important to us and how we want to live our lives and really think about sort of small things we can do in line with our values that can actually help us to feel much more 
content. Oh, thank you for explaining that. It's such an interesting theory, isn't it? And I, we often say uh, you don't need a battle on a battle. Mm. So if you've got emotions that are making you feel sad, angry, worried, to say you haven't got them is is doubling almost the effect of those emotions, isn't it? And and as sometimes we say it's a bit like like you say you're jack in the box or a carpet, a rug. And you brush them under because you can't deal with them right now. But then one day you need to shake the rug and yeah. that can be really, really uncomfortable. Absolutely. So so, so with the question um, around disjointed emotions, yeah. I mean, I think everybody responds differently to, to going through breast cancer <clears throat> in the treatment. But all emotions are valid and understandable. Um, and often people can't process their emotions um kind of at the time of treatment i know i felt this to a large extent i felt no i just need to get through this grueling treatment i kind of have to put one of the, some of this aside there's there's bits that i know that are too difficult to explore right now but i knew i'd have to come back to them um and so it can mean that you have lots of kind of conflicting emotions when you finish treatment there might be you know, some sense of relief um, that, you, you know, you've got through it. And and that that can be exacerbated by other people saying, oh, you must be so relieved. Mm -hmm. But also there could be a big part of you where it's it's all really hitting you now. You've got that, that space to be able to really feel what you feel. Um, and so you can really kind of connect with the distress. You can feel quite angry um at times angry that you've had to go through this um so yeah a, a lot can hit you i think um <laughs> at, at any point but. but like you say sarah and we see this on the helpline from calls that we get in and again tomorrow's gone no service that often it's when treatment finishes isn't it it's the enormity of what you've gone through actually mm. hits you but that's often at a time where you, like you say people around you i say oh come on now let's back to normal and oh isn't it great it's finished yes. and we often hear sarah you know that people sometimes have a feeling of guilt you know well i'm so lucky because i had mm. this and i got through it so like you say there's so many emotions aren't there not just from ourselves but from from other people as well yeah and and for me i had radiotherapy last so i went from having you know daily treatment to then not having anything i can't remember how for how many weeks but it felt a bit like falling off a cliff i'd had this mm. really intensive treatment period and then suddenly i was on my own Oh, that's how it felt. Yeah. And a lot of people explain that as intense as the treatment is. And there's, I don't know if you're familiar with the article, uh, it's a beautiful article written by Peter Harvey, Life After Treatment. And yes. it's so eloquent, isn't it? How yes. it explains you really, you're on that roller coaster ride, hanging on tight and for the next treatment, but there's people around you. And it's when that treatment finishes that you get off. And we often hear that, you know, there can often be a feeling of isolation at the yeah. end of when treatment finishes, which conflicts with a sense of relief as well yeah absolutely so, yeah we've had another question in um from pippa and she's wondering if you could recommend any techniques to stop stop second guessing results information what if they're wrong that's mm. another good question pippa thank you mm. yes I'm, I'm sure many people can can identify with that i think this is really about noticing when you're doing that first of all because our our mind is always busy it's always full of th thoughts that's what our minds do and it will tend to jump to the worst case scenario because our mind is trying to protect us and if it it thinks if it flags the worst case scenario we can think about how to how to deal with that but it's not always helpful for us and so when you notice that that's where your mind is going it's helpful to just try and connect with the present moment because usually the present moment right here right now is tolerable it's the, the kind of thoughts about difficult things in the past and our worries about the future that feel really intolerable and increase our distress so coming back to just this present moment and 
perhaps engaging in some mindfulness exercises. Um, so that's just connecting with what's going on for me right now and anchoring in something, perhaps the breath. So just spending a couple of minutes just observing your breath, noticing if thoughts are coming up, but trying not to get too hooked by them. Instead, just bringing your attention back to your breathing, back to this present moment. Because right here, right now, you can probably get through this. That's that's really helpful. Sarah, do you ever find it useful to to name, uh, Pippa was saying, you know, the thoughts or is it is it useful to name it? Mm. Yeah, I think it's about doing that in a way that it, you don't get too hooked into it. So sometimes it can be useful to kind of label the thoughts in themes. So as you're as you're sitting and being present and just noticing what's going through your mind, maybe labeling them as, oh, there's worries about the future. Oh, there's worries about the past. You know, there's me thinking about my to do list um, so that you're it enables you to take a bit of a step back from from the thoughts and see them from what for what they are. They're just mental events. They're not the truth. They're just things passing through our minds. Um, and uh, we we sometimes talk about the idea of, of of having a Teflon mind, you know, the non-stick coating. So we want the thoughts to be able to pass through without getting too attached to them. Mm-hmm. Because the thoughts will come, won't they, Sarah? Mm-hmm. We can't sort of say, oh, no, don't worry about it. Don't that they, they are there. They're real, aren't they? But it's about them not sticking, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And we, we can often fall into telling ourselves, just don't think about that. <laughs> but, you know, if I say to you, don't think about a pink elephant. That's what I was just <laughs> going to say the same thing. There's a great big one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's acknowledging that they will come, allowing them to be there, but trying not to get too hooked up on them. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you, Sarah, for that. <clears throat> Now, um, Mary's um, sent a question in, and it it ties very much with what you've said earlier, Sarah, that maybe we can expand on. But Mary's saying, if I just keep myself busy and distract myself, I don't get upset. And Mary's saying, well, isn't this a better way of coping? Mm. Yes. I mean, distractions are really useful tool. And I used it lots. Um, You know, Netflix was my best friend (laughs) going through treatment. Um, So, yes, it does help, but it's that balance between using it to help you get through some difficult times versus overusing it and never connecting with the feeling because that's what's going to lead to difficulties later on. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I say, it can can mean that you, um, uh, you have your difficult emotions popping up when you, you don't expect them. It can also mean that actually you lose lose contact with more pleasant emotions as well because we right. can't really pick and choose which emotions we experience so if you're you know tra- distracting from the unpleasant stuff you're also not going to be noticing the pleasant stuff that's a really good point yeah um and you know sometimes we can fall into um you know bad bad habits by trying to distract You know, so I mentioned my my Netflix addiction, but, um, you know, that's all well and good for a certain amount of time. But if that's all I'm doing all day, I'm not going to finish that day feeling content. I'm not going to feel like I've um, lit that I'm living my life in in line with my values. You know, things that are dear to me are things like connection with other people. It's um, feeling helpful towards others. You know, if I'm lying on the sofa watching Netflix all day, I'm not. I'm not doing mm. those things, and I'm. And so I'm going to feel worse. Actually, so that can be a downward spiral, Sarah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Which is why this, you know, the, the theories such as ACT are so important, aren't they? Because you're not saying things are okay. You're saying mm-hmm. you're acknowledging that things are hard and they're challenging, but it's about being able to live with that, isn't it? Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Uh, We've had uh, another question from Sarah, your namesake, Sarah. (laughs) And Sarah's saying, who should I tell about my diagnosis? Mm. 
It's an interesting question, isn't it? Yeah, and it's a very, a very personal, personal one. I think. I think if I bring it back again to 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 values. So, um, in my in my book, I actually include an exercise that helps you to really um, narrow down what's important to you and which values are most key. And one of mine was around around connection. Was and still is. I'm someone who who likes people and likes to be around people. And also authenticity was another key value for me whilst going through my treatment. And so for me, it was important to share my diagnosis, share what I was going through with close people around me. But that might not be right for everyone. So it's thinking about what's, what's important to you and what the likely response is that you're going to get. So, you know, if there are people in your life who you know don't tend to be very supportive, then you might not want to tell them or you might not want to tell them very much. Um, You know, we all have some people who we're closer to. I think about doing this because I, I often use the analogy of like a dartboard So you might have like one or two people who are in the bullseye who are really close to you. And then you've got the outer ring of the bullseye. So they're still really close, but not quite as close as those people in the middle. And then as we move out, we get more to sort of, you know, general acquaintances and then maybe people at work. Um, And so it's thinking about, you know, sharing different amounts maybe with those different types of, of connections um and also thinking about you know who could be practical support for you so you know i found it really important to accept help from people whilst i was going through treatment and that doesn't necessarily come naturally to me um and sometimes it's difficult to take up offers of support when it's kind of a vague oh let me know if i can do anything um, but what my husband and I agreed was that if anyone offered a kind of concrete support, so a friend, a very nice friend, offered to make us a family meal once a week that she delivered to our door, which was just such a treat. So my husband and I agreed if we got offers like that, we would accept them. Whether or not we felt at the time we needed them, it was it was all going to help. Um so for me, it was important to tell people to, in, in order to get that support from other people. But as I say, it is a very personal decision. Um, but I think as well, be aware of some of the thoughts that show up when you think about um, telling people. Because I hear all the time in my clinical practice that people are reluctant to share their difficulties with others because they worry that that's going to burden the other person. You know, oh, they've got enough on their plate. They don't want to hear about my struggles. You know, I don't want to be a miserable friend. And that can really keep people at a distance. But if you think, you know, if the tables were turned, would I want the other person to tell me what was going on for them? Would I want to be there for them? Would I want to provide support from the, for them? And probably the answer is yes, and yeah. probably they would feel the same way towards you. And that's a very useful way of looking at it, isn't it? So like you say, if the tables were turned. Yeah. And I think sometimes, Sarah, and you, I don't know what you think about this, but sometimes, like you say, it's other people's reactions that can be quite difficult to manage and they can be on quite a spectrum can't they it it can be oh my goodness no this is just so awful and you know you think oh no I've got my head around it and I'm doing okay so then you end up sort of supporting other person or uh, other people that say oh yeah well I had that and I had that you know so there's there's quite extremes isn't there of reactions absolutely yeah which I guess is why you need your dartboard don't you (laughs) (laughs) yeah and 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 not everyone is going to respond in a way that you will find helpful um and again you know when that happened to me I sometimes found myself feeling quite angry about that or frustrated it's okay um but what helped me was to think you know actually 
even with my skills as a clinical psychologist, have there been times when people have shared something with me and I kind of haven't known how to respond for the best. And, you know, that's probably how they felt too. Um, so I try to take a kind of compassionate stance, yeah. thinking about how it might have been for the other person or that actually they responded in a way that didn't feel helpful, but it was maybe because they were really distressed by yeah. it and they were trying to manage their own yeah. emotions. But it comes from a good place, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it I comes from a point of the, caring. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's a skill in itself, isn't it? To sort of peel off the layers of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I hope that's helped answer um, uh, Sarah's question. So um, Pam's um, asked a question. Um, Sarah, and I wonder how you feel about this, but Pam's asking, is it better for my emotional well-being to stop work? Mm, another interesting one. Mm. And I think another very individual um, one. Again, it comes back to thinking about your your values and what's important to you. Is work and being sort of productive at work, is that something that is important to you and what does work bring for you does work bring stress and anxiety or does work bring a sense of fulfillment a sense of connection with others um, a sense of being helpful or effective so depending on the answers to those questions i think will will depend on whether it's a good idea to be working or not and I think you also have to be kind to yourself and allow enough time to look after yourself through through all of this. Um, now, you know, hopefully employers, you know, should be able to offer flexible um, working arrangements. So it's not just a case, perhaps, of I go back or I don't. You know, there might be ways that you can like, adjust your uh, your work or just your your hours so that work is more manageable and that you get the benefits from it without the downside of perhaps feeling stressed and tired and overwhelmed. Mm. Um, so for me personally, you know, work is a big part of my identity. Um, I've spent many, many years training to do what I do. I really love what I do. Um, so it was important for me to continue to work that had to be in a much more reduced way than I would normally work um, but for me it helped me to kind of hold on to a sense of um, normality as I say apart my identity um, and to feel like I was still able to be there for other people and be helpful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know when I was sitting in my therapy room with a client my attention was on them and their their difficulties and so in a way it gave me a break from my own <laughs> mm, yeah, that was your distraction isn't yeah it? yeah and it can be a double-edged sword can't it and i know there's an organization called working with cancer that's very supportive about you know returning to work and you know you're working right so that's mm -hmm. always a, a good okay. link but sometimes when people feel as though they have a loss of control because of what's happening with their treatment actually being at work is something that they mm. feel they control and we hear that a lot from people where they they get uh, you know support actually fr from that if you want to call it that normality of work in whatever shape that may be yeah yeah that's really true i think for me yeah enabled me to feel yeah in control competent um yeah i think uh exercise became something that was about me kind of regaining some sense of control and um, feeling like I could do something to um, sorry, sort of support myself as well. Yeah. Oh, Sarah, you'll have to listen into our Facebook Live on Thursday because that's on exercise. So. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> 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 but before that, now Rachel's um, written a question, and I think this is such a good question again that we hear. And Rachel's saying, "How can I deal with anger?" Mm. Anger is a really tricky one because it's a it's an emotion that 
lots of us find quite difficult and can judge and feel I shouldn't be feeling angry. Um, but yeah, going back to what I said earlier about all emotions being valid and understandable and, and part of the human experience, um, you know, anger is, an, is a normal human emotion. Um, I guess what can be problematic is how, we'll, how we deal with the anger or how we express it. Um, and I think if we're not allowing time to really connect with our emotions, if we're not being mindful about our thoughts and feelings in, in the present moment, and if we're therefore not aware of anger being around, it can mean we end up kind of snapping at other people, uh, perhaps, yeah, taking out that anger on other people, um, or sometimes taking out the anger on ourselves um, and doing things that are harmful to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just really important to allow yourself to connect with that and to, to un understand where that's coming from and to let go of some of the judgments about anger. And well, when you say judgments about mm -hmm. anger, Sarah, do, do you mean that's your own judgments, the guilt that you might feel about yeah Be, being angry yeah 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 you mentioned guilt so anger would see as like a primary emotion it's it's you know very um automatic response when we feel um something is um unjustified or there's someone that's sort of overstepping a boundary it's you know very normal human reaction the guilt then comes in as a secondary emotion because of what we tell ourselves about the anger because we say it's wrong to feel angry. I shouldn't mm -hmm. feel angry in this situation. <clears throat> it's not fair on the other person that I'm angry. And so then we feel guilty. Mm -hmm. But it's the anger that comes first. first. But, you know, Sarah, if someone's feeling happy, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they've got, they're, they're, they're really joyful and they're happy, you wouldn't say to them, oh, could you stop being happy? No, absolutely. Yeah, with Can anger, yeah. we stop being angry. And it's quite, I don't know, yeah, I find yeah. that very interesting how, like you say, it's a very valid emotion, isn't it? So you... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, yeah, when, when we're having those pleasant emotions, we absolutely want to connect with those as well. It's not just connecting mm. with, the, with the unpleasant ones. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. We, we do make judgments of other people's anger. Um, but... Um, yeah, if you're able to be more mindful of it, you're more likely to be able to communicate that in a way that another person can hear. And they'll be able to so say, that yeah, might I get be, that. I'm feeling angry. Something yeah. straightforward. So that may actually saying that you feel angry may prevent you from snapping or something because yeah. you're not suppressing it. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling angry because I'm really so uh frustrated and cross that i'm having to go through this mm. i don't know what you know why me yes. that's a big question yeah. isn't it mm, i certainly so. had had that why me i live a healthy life mm. you know i i've always watched what i eat and i exercise regularly and i do all the things i'm supposed to do so why am i in this situation yeah. um so yeah it's allowing yourself some time to to acknowledge that that's how you're feeling and to communicate that with, to someone who, who can be supportive. supportive. Yeah. Um, but then, then focusing on, okay, what can I do now that's going to be effective for me? So maybe I need to do something physical to get, to get some of that anger out. Hmm. You know, maybe and, and I, I need just... to write about how I'm feeling yeah. to really yeah. express it. If I haven't, you know, particularly if you haven't got anyone you can talk to, yeah. write it down. And journaling can be very, a very powerful way, can't it, mm. of getting rid of the emotion, but also so beneficial when, you know, as time passes and you look back at what maybe you've written, wow, did I really go through that? Look at my strength and resilience. It can yeah. be quite affirming, can't it? Yeah. Well, I actually started writing the, the, the week that I was diagnosed. I couldn't sleep one night and I just felt I needed to get up and write. So I sat on my computer for an hour or something and just wrote about, you know, what I'd experienced and how I was feeling. And I wrote at the end, oh, maybe this could be a book. 
Um, and then it was you know, a year or so later when this opportunity with um, the Association of Clinical Psychologists came up uh, that I, I put forward my idea of, of the book and, and they loved it. And uh, so, yeah, I agreed to, to write it. And then I went back to what I'd written that night thinking, oh, it, I bet it was completely incoherent and a complete mess. But actually I went back to it and I was like, actually, this is OK. And there was some humour in there, interestingly, mm. as well. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that that formed part of, part of the book. And yeah. yeah, and writing the book was really cathartic for me. Yeah. And wonderful that you can share your experiences as well, Sarah, that, you, you know, it's just so helpful to other people. So I appreciate that. Um, just carrying on from what we said, we've had a, a question in from Catherine. And Catherine's saying, I worry about burdening other people and bringing them down by talking about it. And that sort of links in with what you said previously, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, we've sort of touched on this, but I wonder what you feel about Catherine's question if there's mm. anything more to add yeah yeah I think it's very much yeah that taking the other person's perspective if the tables were turned how would you feel um but also you know you might be underestimating how that other person is able to to you know hear what you've got to say and to be able to 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 sort of shoulder that for you it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be brought down by it you know that actually they might get some um fulfillment from being able to support you um so it might actually be a positive thing not not a negative thing um i i write in the book about how um uh one of my very good friends um came with me to one of my chemo sessions and she was going through a really difficult time at, at, at the time and she ended up talking to me about her stuff and crying while sitting next to me whilst I'm having chemo and uh, she was saying I'm so sorry this wasn't how this was supposed to, to go I was you know I'm supposed to be here for you um, and I said it is absolutely fine it's it's really nice for me to still feel like I can be a support to you yeah so, it was, so. you know the it, uh, there's a concern maybe that the relationship beco becomes one-sided um so i think if you're you know if you're trying to ensure as well that, that in your interactions with others you know you are talking about other things other than your cancer as well you are asking about them how they're doing what's going on in their lives you know you are maybe you know able to connect with some humor I think all that is going to mean that the person doesn't feel overly burdened mm. by, by your share. And, and Sarah, you say about humour and it is okay to laugh, isn't mm. it? It almost seems a bit rude or no, we can't laugh because this is really <laughs> life, a life-challenging moment. But actually, the pleasure and the joy of laughter can be huge, can't it, in the, in the face of adversity? Yeah, yeah, very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I tend to be quite a cheerful person generally, I would say. And uh, I mean, I can't say I was, um, you know, as much as I normally am through my, my um, treatment. But um, yeah, really taking any opportunities to um, connect with things on a more lighthearted level, you know, whether mm -hmm. that's, you know, for me, it was maybe um, playing games with my children or... Um, uh, playing with the dogs or um, yeah having a, having a laugh with a friend yeah very very precious and um, <clears throat> we've come to the end of our, our session we haven't got any more questions in so I think it's sort of quite timely that we end on that mm. positive note <laughs> we know that worry is there for a lot of people and we've sort of talked about that haven't we in the fact that thoughts are not facts and how to use mm. the concept of mindfulness to bring ourselves back to the present and and certainly Sarah from tonight's session that's one thing that stands out for, for me personally is I defy anyone that doesn't have a worry or mm. a, a fear or an anxiety but it's about okay I know you're there but actually I can deal with it by just staying in the here and now. And yeah. that, that can be so useful, can't it? Yeah, 
Yeah. And you say networking with other people who have been through a diagnosis of breast cancer. And like I say, at Breast Cancer Now, we have our Someone Like Me service. Mm. And also our Moving Forward courses, both online and face-to-face, -face, can be hugely valuable for people that just can re uh, well, connect with each other. And yeah. it can be quite isolating, can't it, when you go through a diagnosis of breast mm. cancer. But actually to connect with people that have gone through it can be really useful. So... Um, all the, the information about our services will be in, in the chat. And of course, if anyone has any questions following tonight's session, you're so welcome to ring us on the helpline. Um, the number again will be on the chat and it'd be our pleasure to, to talk that through. But Sarah, I just want to say a huge thank you. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you tonight and thank you for sharing your experiences and for bringing positivity to emotions that can be quite negative. You've, you've turned it on its head, Sarah, and we're <laughs> so grateful for that. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. You're so welcome, so welcome. And so that's it for tonight. So we look forward to seeing you soon. Um, our next Facebook Live, as I say, is in two days' time on exercise. So we look forward to seeing you then. Okay, bye for now. Bye. <laughs>